Well, welcome to our weekly uh, podcast on business strategies during the pandemic, powered by Aurora WDC. My name is Tim Sheehy. I'm the president of the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce. So on our web webcast today, we're gonna look forward in two ways. The first is to provide an update on MMAC's advocacy for a smart restart of our economy. And second, we're gonna provide some insight and advice for doing what you can do to make good business decision decisions when what's happening outside your business is out of control. Our guests today are Jim Page, Vice President of Corporate Attraction and Expansion for M7, Kim Korth, President and CEO of Sixth Avenue Group and Managing Director of Engage Workforce Solutions, and Russ Klisch, President of Lakefront Brewing. But first, a message from our sponsor, ERC Midwest. To learn more about ERC Midwest, go to ercmidwest.com backslash MMAC. If you have anxious employees, develop a thoughtful, documented, and well-communicated plan of action. Acknowledge the anxiety, give employees peace of mind, and consider using outside experts for legitimacy, certification, and effectiveness. Thank you for that message from ERC Midwest. Next. So we're entering our sixth week of Safer at Home, which is one measure of the impact on our business and personal well being under the COVID 19 crisis. Like many of you, I share the challenges of running an organization where disruption and uncertainty are a reality. With team members who have been furloughed and those working remotely feeling isolated and stressed. I've also seen, as you have, my colleagues step up and deliver on our value proposition. What I've never seen in 30 plus years is the speed at which livelihoods have been disrupted. Nationally, job losses in April are expected to wipe out the 22 million jobs gained over the last decade. And closer to home, 500,000 jobless claims filed since early March are 15 times higher than the same period a year ago. As MMAC Chairman Jonas Priesing, who is Chair of Manpower Group notes, to go forward, we're going to go back to the future, not back to business as normal. So how do we move forward? Well, someone was sitting in my chair during the Civil War, the Spanish flu, two world wars, and countless recessions. Over 159 years, the business community has found value in a collective response to their challenges and opportunities. We thank you for your support. And if you're not a member, we'd love to have you join and lean in with your peers to help make this region more globally competitive, delivering high value jobs that support a vibrant quality of life for all. And dealing with the COVID crisis is no different. Our objective is to balance the interrelated goals of health, safety, economy, and community. And to support this objective, we have a threefold strategy to help drive through the crisis, recovery, and the next normal. The first at the center of the circle here is to inform. We need to assess and learn the facts that will provide you with the information to make better business decisions. We were a first mover to partner with a medical college of Wisconsin to earn your respect as a trusted source for that information. One deliverable which you're experiencing today is, a daily, is the weekly webinar. And then we have a series of daily webinars with the medical college of Wisconsin delivering best practices, covering a wide range of topics while also keeping you informed. To date, we have an audience of over 30,000 unique viewers. Our second strategy is to advocate, to lead the effort to represent Metro Milwaukee employers in advocating for public policy that makes this a better place to do business 
in balancing our interrelated objectives of health, safety, economy, and community. We've also spent time uh, working with hundreds of employers on individual requests that they've had uh, impacting their business everywhere from federal legislation to local healthcare regulations. And third, to collaborate, to serve as a resource for employers to share best practices. Our website has evolved over the past two months to provide best in class information. You can go there and find chief human resource officers sharing their plans to meet employee and consumer and customer safety. Um, you can sample communications. There's a PPE marketplace exchange for those making and for those needing PPE equipment for their businesses. And in addition, our uh, charitable arm has been serving as a resource for organizations like Mask Force, led by Husco, um, Briggs and Stratton, and Quad Graphics, producing at cost reusable masks for our healthcare industry, and also for efforts like Feeding the Frontline as a collaboration for employers uh, reaching out to help those on the front line of our healthcare services. These best practices are more than just a resource. We believe they are the key to building employee and consumer confidence, which is the best medicine to cure this economic cold. So let me wrap up by addressing MMAC's role as an advocate. Early on, our advocacy was shaped by what our members experienced in their workplaces in other countries, by the concerns of our hospital leaders, and by the impact on community health. MMAC was supportive and encouraged Governor Evers to address the need for social distancing, something many of our member companies were doing on their own. And while Safer at Home was a blunt instrument, we applaud Governor Evers for acting on this. This public act, along with a number of private actions, had a major benefit in minimizing the crisis of care for our healthcare institutions, both for those being served and those serving. Our goal was a data-informed decision-making guided by the experience of our healthcare leaders. It is now this same data-focused reality that led us to the conclusion that the path forward needs to be altered and accelerated by a smart restart of the economy. So last Friday, the MMAC board passed a unanimous consent resolution urging Governor Evers to commence a phased opening of the economy prior to May 26th. And given the improving metrics under the Badger bounce back plan to advance to a phase one opening as early as May 11th. A reopening that would allow most businesses this week to prepare for a phased opening while encouraging those who can remote work remotely and still limiting small public gatherings. This has been communicated to the governor and the legislative leaders of both parties. <clears throat> Our sole focus is to influence policy that puts Wisconsin in a stronger position. There are three reasons driving this next step of ours. The first is that our hospital systems are not in crisis. They have the metrics to guide their response and they have a responsibility to communicate if they are in crisis. This is not a hospital crisis and they have communicated as much. The second, the designation of essential versus non-essential businesses was a blunt instrument to manage safer at home. Many more employers could safely open for business without impacting the safety and health of their employees or their customers. Think of a small business like Built Right Furniture that is closed when you can go buy the same product uh, in a Walmart. And that inconsistency, we think, could be better fleshed out with a smart restart and an opening, giving those businesses, particularly small and mid-sized retailers, the opportunity to come safely back into the economy. And finally, the path forward is based on a private-public partnership that builds trust 
and consumer confidence. If we are going to reopen this economy and we are going to accelerate a recovery, it's gonna be based on those two principles. And as I turn to Jim Page and bring him into this discussion, of the 30% drop in Wisconsin's GDP, only four to 6% is due to businesses sidelined under safer at home. So to accelerate towards a consistent recovery, we are going to take, need to take those next steps to rebuild consumer confidence and employee confidence in the health and safety of their workplace. So we believe the facts dictate that we move to a smart restart and we're encouraging Governor Evers to do so. So Jim, let me turn to you. You've done a kind of an interesting piece of research um, in your role of attracting uh, companies and working with companies that are expanding in the region. Um, and you put together a little overview of how Safer at Home is impacting Wisconsin's economy, but also how the lack of consumer confidence and consumer actions are impacting Wisconsin's GDP. Yeah, that, that's exactly it, Tim. Thanks so much. So um, COVID-19 is certainly the most significant public health crisis most of us have ever experienced, but it's really unique in that it's brought on a second crisis, which is an economic crisis. And the velocity of that crisis is really unprecedented. Uh, Tim hinted at some of these numbers and you see them up there on the screen, but they, they really are astonishing. So today, when uh, the Department of Workforce Development actually reports out unemployment numbers, uh, and this is folks that have filed for unemployment in the state of Wisconsin, we believe that nearly 500,000 Wisconsinites will have filed for unemployment. And that's, this is just since March the 14th. So to put that into perspective, about 3 million people, plus or minus, were working in the state of Wisconsin in February. So we've gone from full employment to pushing 20% unemployment, and that's been in the space of about six weeks. And there's also been a pretty sobering study by UW-Madison that estimates that we've seen about a 30% decline in economic output in the state of Wisconsin since the crisis started. So we look at those and also take a look more broadly at some of the national indicators, and unfortunately, the story isn't a whole lot better. So in March, consumer spending was down about 7.5%, and that was really before we felt the full economic impact of a variety of different uh, stay-at-home orders that have been implemented uh, around the country and certainly, of course, right here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we also think that second quarter GDP is likely to be down somewhere between 8 to, an, 8 to 11% compared to a year uh, earlier. So these are obviously concerning numbers for a lot of different reasons. So as Tim indicated, we decided to take a little closer look at that 30% decline in Wisconsin economic output, specifically if we could see how much of that decline was explained and attributable um, to the mandated closure of businesses that was contained in Governor Evers' Safer at Home order, and how much of it was attributable to the, to the broader decline in consumer and business spending that's really brought on by social distancing. So the findings, and you see them there on the slide, um, are, are really interesting. So that mandated closure, so these are mostly consumer-facing businesses, bars, restaurants, retailers, companies that deliver personal services. They account for only about 4 to 6% of the decline in economic output. The much larger share, which is around 25%, comes from the broader pullback of consumer and business spending that has resulted from social distancing. So these are companies that they've been allowed to continue operating, but they've seen dramatic decreases in revenue. So it's companies tied to travel, manufacturing, professional services, real estate, just a whole host of companies for which consumer demand has really started to soften. So as Tim talked about uh, just a moment ago, as we start to think about and engage in a smart restart of the Wisconsin economy, we think a few things are really important. So first, uh, we do need to move away from this discussion and this differentiation of essential versus non-essential businesses. The, the real damage to the Wisconsin economy has been done less by mandated closure of businesses and more just by the big drop in consumer demand and business spending. So as we think about how do we create some economic momentum in the coming weeks and months, 
we, we really need to look at how we build confidence among consumers and employees that some sort of a return, and it's going to be gradual, but a return to, to normalcy of economic life is safe. And the key there really is companies embracing the implementation of workplace procedures that stem the spread of COVID-19. So it needs to be visible to consumers. So when they walk into a business, they need to feel that it's safe. They need to see that their safety is being taken seriously by, by the business. And really the same needs to be true for employees that are returning to their workplaces. They have to see that the, their employer has thought about their safety and is doing things again to stem the spread of COVID-19. So bottom line here, uh, we, we believe and we think the numbers certainly indicate that people just aren't going to feel or aren't going to return to normal economic life until they start to feel safe. Jim, thank you very much. A very interesting piece of work uh, that has an impact uh, on the policy positions uh, that we've taken uh, and I think helps people give uh, a little bit of insight into the steps that we need to take. Um, so as we push on uh, advocacy and try to work with the legislature and the governor to move forward, I wanna bring uh, both Kim Korth and Russ Klisch uh, into the conversation, uh, because I think one of the challenging things that you have as employees uh, and business owners and business leaders is a lot of this is out of control and out of your control. So I have a great deal of respect for uh, Kim and Russ, uh, their business acumen and their leadership, and we thought they would be um, two great participants uh, in presenting uh, what you can be doing in your own business uh, to take control of a situation that is out of control. So Kim, with that introduction, um, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, you'll be joined uh, after that by Russ. And again, if you have questions, uh, please submit them and we'll uh, get them into the discussion also. Kim, thank you and Russ, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, as many of you, I've participated in dozens and dozens of webinars. I want to thank uh, MMAC because I think they're doing a terrific job of being very proactive in trying to help the economy and their members. But I do get frustrated as a business leader that I'm just sort of sitting there as a spectator and I can't control whether, you know, certain businesses are going to be able to reopen. I can't control whether the schools are there. And so we wanted to take a little bit different um, look at this from an engage uh, perspective and engage as a temporary staffing business that focuses primarily on manufacturing and distribution. So we've been doing a series of sort of thought pieces on how can you at least take this situation and make as, as positive an impact on your business as possible. So I just have a few points on three uh, slides that I'll go through relatively quickly. And then I know Tim said there will be a possibility of question and answer towards the end. <laughs> I think one of the biggest things, and it's, it's a, uh, something that Jim was referencing as well as Tim, is the changes in patterns of demand. And this has been one of the most difficult issues for companies to handle. Uh, the speed with which this happened, where you go from the lowest unemployment we've had in history and 45 days later, it's the highest unemployment we've had uh, in probably over 100 years. Uh, the speed with which it's happened has been really difficult. And previous demand patterns, so how you forecast, really aren't relevant anymore. And external information to help guide whether you're going to, you know, how do you produce, how do you plan, how do you put your production schedules together is either non-existent or it's based on somebody else's best guess. So what we believe is that you, you're going to have to do a little bit more as a company to uh, get better at forecasting your own demand. And so we have a few ideas. First is just look for longer term, likely permanent changes in demand. Uh, this is a pretty easy one. Hand sanitizer. While the demand may go down a bit as the crisis lessens, the level of sales has probably been permanently altered upward. So if you look at those types of situations, then your historic patterns of sales, even when we get back to some degree of normalcy, is probably not valid anymore. So you need to take a look at that uh, from a macro perspective. Really important, particularly for smaller companies, is to, to do what we call shorten your feedback loops with your customers. In our opinion, you need to be in almost daily contact to get a good and real-time indication on orders, uh, how are they doing in their future opportunities, and when are they going to potentially get in trouble, the strength of their position. And the lower you are in the food chain, in other words, you're a supplier that supplies somebody that supplies somebody that eventually ends up as the end consumer, the more vulnerable you are to guesses that are happening above you. 
also, you really need to get your entire organization, not just your sales team, but people in operations, people in product management, to be connecting with those customers to get as much intelligence as you can in terms of how they're doing and how comfortable you can be with their orders and when they're likely to restart, et cetera. Um, this one's a pretty obvious one, but we're amazed at how many clients haven't actually made a lot of progress here. Have backup plans for every single source critical supplier you have. There are going to be ongoing disrupt, uh, disruptions for the foreseeable future, I would say, for the next year or two. For example, it's not clear how much uh, manufacturing is going to be moved out of China. It's not clear exactly how the Mexico, if you have any Mexican operations, that's even more problematic than what we're dealing with in the United States right now. So you need to be careful that you don't get become a hostage of an individual supplier uh, during this uh, situation and probably for the foreseeable future. And the last one, and I've seen this in uh, previous situations before, don't jump in on a short-term opportunity that may leave you just starting to produce things as demand goes down. For example, there's been this insane demand for PPE that's eventually going to be filled. We think it's starting to get there already. Don't put yourself in a position that your line is just starting to run these kind of products as the demand plateaus, and then you're stuck with a bunch of inventory. It's not a core area for you. And so you end up um, having more costs than you have return. So our only suggestion is do a thorough investigation of anything that's outside your core area, whether it's an outside of the market, customer, product, or process type, and make as intelligent a decision as you can. I think diversification is a great idea, so long as it's not just built on short, what is currently short-term opportunity. Next slide, please. Need the next slide? Thank you. Um, the other way of, to look at this is to retool, and the, and the most sustainable return you can have is retool shop floor practices to support demand volatility. Uh, learn how to produce in smaller lot sizes. This is the only sustainable way not to be whipsawed by changes in demand. Try to analyze your overall production processes and identify ways, ways to move towards continuous flow. So do take the time right now to identify where you have production bottlenecks, look for ways to reduce lot sizes, and maximize operator efficiency. So hopefully the operator is able to make more and more of the decisions on the shop floor. Uh, we do recommend in some cases to build a buffer in inventory. We know this sounds like the opposite of lean principles. I've been trained in lean for 30 years. But in the current environment, it may make sense to build a buffer of inventory of some critical components, particularly if they have high setup times. Um, and the fourth point related to this is take this opportunity to reduce setup times in, in, in particular in core um, production areas. Do a Pareto on your top 10 worst setup times and work to improve them. This is an extremely important focus area as it will make your company more permanently capable of dealing with demand volatility. And in one of the articles, I referenced that we have a plastics injection molder that was able to reduce their setup time on one station from eight hours to an hour and a half by taking some creative ideas that completely changed the types of products that they were make, the volume levels that they can deal with, et cetera. And we didn't, I didn't put it on here, but the other thing that a lot of companies are doing is take this opportunity to do as much preventative maintenance as you possibly can, because it's a great opportunity to get yourself set when your production volumes start to come back up. Next slide, please. And I sort of alluded to this, but it's, it's really important because I think this is something that needs to happen going forward, is the need for more flexible planning. Um, I'm concerned that too many companies are focused on making it through the crisis with the assumption that at some point things are going to return to normal. Um, I'm not sure what normal is anymore. I don't think anybody knows. And so the best way you can protect yourself is to start thinking in terms of increasing your organizational flexibility so you can deal with changes more effectively and rapidly than you have in the past. So how do you do that? Doing daily huddles, whether that's production, that's sales, that's you know, uh, engineering, whatever that may be. I keep beating the drum on producing in the smaller lot sizes. Um, shorten your planning horizons. You still need to, you still can do a strategic plan looking at a year or three years, but you should have much shorter planning horizons for are we making progress? Is there trend improvement weekly, monthly? Because that will allow you to pivot depending upon whether or not um, something happens with one of your clients. We have a major client, for example, that has on up and down about four times in the last three weeks. They're going to be totally shut down. Oh, no, we need 10 more people. Oh, no, we're going to shut down again. And they're not trying to jerk us around. They don't know. So the only way we can deal with this is to look at much shorter time frames in terms of how can we react uh, more effectively. Already talked about more consistent communication with customers. 
And then clearly a uh, greater delegation of authority. So you have people that are in the trenches that can make decisions when they need to make decisions, as opposed to having to go through multiple levels and checks because it, it's just too slow. And so the more that you can do to allow yourself, and then we'll use the term pivot a lot, pivot depending upon what's going on, I think will be important for companies. And then last but certainly not least, focus on building a bench. Um, the current crisis has amplified most companies' dependence on a handful of highly skilled over, older workers. This has been a problem that everybody's been worried about in manufacturing for the last 10 to 15 years, and now it's come to vivid light for many uh, companies because as baby boomers continue to retire, they're currently the most susceptible to COVID-19. There is not the bench to back them up. In many cases, we know many clients that have three, four, five people that if they're gone, they're in serious trouble because there's no one else that can do what they do. So we urge our clients to use this situation to start making serious headway on developing the next generation of leaders. So first and foremost, we term, the term we use, codify the knowledge of your highly skilled workers. Spend the time to document what they know, how they do what they do, so that um, there's a great definition. Um, there was an older uh, theory that was done by C.K. Pralahad and Gary Hamill called the core competency of the organization. And their comment is, you can't have a core competency if it can walk out the door. So if you have a really good tooling guy, you have a really good setup person, you have a really good engineer who is uh, close to retirement, you need to really start to use this time to proactively get backup for them. One of the ways you can do that is job shadow with younger workers. So you assign a younger worker with them to be able to um, begin to do the codification as we talked about and also learn what they're doing. And clearly and proactively move your skilled workers into more coaching roles versus doing the work roles. Yes, they can do it faster. Yes, it's easier if you've got to get something out the door on Friday to just have Bob go do it. But that just keeps you vulnerable to when Bob retires or Bob becomes susceptible to COVID. So you have to use this time to be able to get that backup of, of different types of younger workers and um, people that are going to be the next genera generation of leadership for your company. And then last, focus on digitizing many of your current manual processes. Too many companies still rely on super um, tribal, super um, manual types of knowledge. It's all in Excel spreadsheets or it's all done. Even in some cases, we see, still see people out on the shop floor with clipboards and they're still writing things down. Um, take some of your younger workforce and have them work with the group that's been doing it this way forever and have them look for ways to digitize. Um, and then um, that's a great way also to integrate your older and younger workforce. So that's the, it, it, from a prepared uh, remarks perspective. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Kim. That's a very thorough and I think action oriented agenda. Uh, that whether you're manufacturing or uh, any other company, uh, you could pick up and, and act on. So I'm going to bring Russ into the conversation who has a more retail kind of customer focused uh, business uh, and get his input and then remind you again, if you've got questions, please submit them uh, and we'll engage uh, Russ and Kim in a little Q&A with you. So Russ, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. But yeah, well, we're going through a lot of different changes here uh, at the brewery. Uh, first and foremost, you know, once this hit, we had to change what we were, we were doing with both our, our beer hall and, and restaurant uh, to switching to going to carry out um, on, on there. Uh, we have other specials that come along with this that we've been doing from our uh, half price cheese curds to to growler nights and how to run things out and how to try to make sure everything is, is safe for the the people that uh, that come here so it's it's still a, a big learning curve it's just not something that we were able to uh, to jump into we always had a little bit of carry out but nothing of this uh, magnitude um, so we're currently constantly trying to uh, in increase and come up with different ideas what we're trying to do there. Uh, the brewery has also had to, to pivot uh, dramatically from where we were. 30% uh, of our sales were draft, and that basically just dried up overnight uh, that we had. Um, also, a lot of the distributors uh, in, in our, uh, that take our product requested fewer products from us. Uh, they don't want to uh, have as much inventory, and they want to just concentrate on, on a few things. So we've been able to start to pare down some of our uh, inventory that we had. 
Uh, they've also asked for bigger packages. Uh, so we will try to produce more in, in larger packages right now. Uh, we also had to try to get our, our brewery and everybody here accustomed to the new um, safety techniques that we are, we'll have from wearing masks to wearing gloves uh, that we have at, at the brewery. Um, and we've also spent a lot of time here trying to look at what we are going to be like when we are able to open up. Uh, it's going to be a world of change from when we originally started uh, or we, we shut down originally. Uh, we were first brewery or first uh, restaurant in town to basically close our, our doors. Our beer hall that we had, uh, for those of you who have been here, it was uh, a place that um, was very happy. A lot of people came and, and, and came in here, but uh, from my uh, standpoint of transmitting the virus, it was not very good. We knew that, and we closed it down. But currently, we're, you know, we're looking at, you know, besides, you know, moving the tables uh, that we have here from anywhere from about 25 to 50 percent of the uh, capacity that we had. Um, and here we've tried taking a lot of the things that anything would be touched from our towel dispensers. We've changed the faucets on our sink, uh, soap dispensers, towels, uh, all everything being automatic. Uh, we right now at starting up will not have our dance floor in, anymore. Um, we're having um, anything that could, anybody could touch try to be removed. Any doors we can have propped open, we will be doing that. So when you walk in, you will not be touching a knob. We'll be putting uh, toe pushes on all the doors that we'd be having here. Um, and we'll also probably have shields up here between the employees and, and the visitors. Uh, currently, we're also looking at going to, uh, or we have all brought in a touchless payment system. Uh, we'll probably just be all credit cards or debit cards, no cash uh, moving forward uh, right now. Uh, we're also looking at trying to, that you can um, reserve a table on a Friday night or during the week uh, for, a, uh, for a meal and you can actually pay for it uh, before you come here with your tips so you never have to take out any cash. Uh, so essentially you could probably walk into our place and um, have your meal uh, get your drinks and without even um, really almost touching anything besides the uh, the table and and the uh, forks and, and knives and spoons. And also, there's a huge education process that we'll be looking to go through uh, with our our entire staff, uh, which is to me is very important. Uh, to me, the the next leg of of trying to bring everything back to where it was is uh, you know being having the staff. Um, educated and also once the public can see what the staff is doing and what we've done here they will become educated in what to do and what not to do with the virus um, i thought jim was talking about uh, a great point about once everybody gets back to the workplace uh, you'll see what everybody's been doing and the, the do's and the don'ts that you can and cannot do and i think that once everybody understands and sees what all the bars and restaurants and all the people are doing there it's going to be very important i think our best educators that we will have will be some of our service industry workforce that we will have we'll be able to tell everybody what to do why they're doing it and once they see their peers doing this they will understand that they will need to do it also but those are a few things that we have uh, been doing and how it's going to change and affect us very helpful, uh, Russ, and I'm going to bring uh, Kim back in here um, and Jim because we've got a quite a few questions, uh, and so I'm going to have Chris go to the audience, but uh, Russ, I can't help it. I just got to ask you the first question. Uh, are you going to come out with a signature COVID brew? <laughs> right now, no, there's no plans for that. Uh, we'll have, well, we, we have several brews that we've been doing that will be aging in barrels right now. That's one thing the brewing industry is doing is uh, the long-term aging of, of uh, barrel-aged beer. So we'll have, we have several in there right now that uh, hopefully people will enjoy later. Yeah, that gives me something to look forward to. So uh, uh, Chris, go ahead. We've got questions. Sure thing. Russ, first of all, several people wrote in and thank you for keeping the taps flowing. And I know uh, several MMAC staff members would uh, join them in that. Uh, the first question we had is actually a good one for all of you. Uh, just expanding on the idea of overcoming consumer fear without a vaccine in place. What can we do to make consumers more confident to go out and be present in an environment when there isn't a vaccine to, to sort of keep us all safe?
I, I can uh, just go ahead with that. Yeah. Uh, to... Go ahead, Russ, and then Kim will unmute. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I unmuted. Go ahead, Russ. Okay. Yeah, to me, it's just basically coming on in and seeing the, the professional uh, way that you have your staff, have, have your place laid out, uh, seeing that everybody can come on in, you know, sit down at a table that's just been sterilized, uh, and they can see how, you know, you, you go and you get a beer. It's not going to be the same way that uh, when somebody orders it, we'll probably all be in plastic cups. You won't be in glasses anymore. You don't want somebody to bring a glass back to the bar that my, somebody might have touched, and somebody goes and grabs it and, and then washes it. You'll you'll see all this. There, there's a true definition between, you know, what people have touched, what people have not touched. And this is going to be, to me, a huge education process for the people itself and also give them confidence that we know what we're doing. And, and once they understand and see it and we can explain it, uh, it, it'll become uh, rather um, uh, reassuring to everyone, and I think it'll be nice and, uh, and comforting. And so I be, believe that people then will start coming back. But there'll be hesitancy at first, but safety will sell. I mean, I think everyone's experienced. I, I stayed at home for five weeks and have started tiptoeing out, going to the grocery store, et cetera, uh, in the last week. And you can be in a grocery store and see people with masks that are like, want you 10 feet away from them. And there are others that you go, excuse me, you're not supposed to bump into me. Can you walk over there for a little bit? I think the, the increase in consumer confidence is going to be when we stop talking about trying to contain the COVID virus. And we start talking about the COVID virus is part of the flu pan panoply that we have and that we're going to have better ways to safeguard against it, but it's going to be here for the foreseeable future. Therefore, we need to figure out a way to live with it. I mean, the, the media focus on one, this is the one thing that has driven everything for the last two months, which we've never had anything like this in the history of mankind. So I think at some point, people are going to start to get more comfortable that they're doing everything they can to be able to make sure they're safe. So like your comment, Russ, they're going to use paper versus or plastic cups versus glass. We're going to remove, you know, door handles, that sort of thing. But I think there's going to be a, a, some degree of normalcy from a fear perspective of what's realistic to expect with any kind of um, bug like this. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that uh, discussion is that uh, without picking on the governor or any other governor, the effort to uh, put in social distancing was a blunt instrument. And when yeah. we start to move from social distancing back to a normal right. environment, it is going to be a blunt instrument to remove it. Uh, and right. we are going to have to rely on just what Russ and Kim were saying, uh, which is businesses will step up to meet the needs of their uh, employees and their consumers. And that's how we're gonna get back faster and more efficiently. Another question for Tim and maybe Jim would have some perspective on this. How does the MMAC board resolution square with some of the federal and state guidelines that are out there already? Well, I, I think that the state effort was informed uh, somewhat by the federal guidelines, but as everybody is uh, abundantly aware, uh, the states are making the decisions about when to reopen uh, and what their reopenings look like. Uh, and so our effort is to encourage, again, based on the facts, that we have flattened the curve, that the healthcare institutions are in relatively good shape, uh, that it's time for Wisconsin to start taking the next steps um, and kind of roll out down the line that Kim and Russ were talking about. Um, and I really like uh, Russ's line here that safety will sell. Uh, and that's exactly what's going to bring our economy back. Uh, and that's where our focus should be going forward. Well, and, and part of the, it goes a little bit to what I was talking about a minute ago, part of the transition in the media coverage went from, we need to flatten the curve to allow the hospitals to deal with everything. So we have to flatten the curve until it goes away. Those are two completely different issues. The federal guidelines and the various, and the states are taking the lead as Tim made reference to there. It's more, the states are making their determination. If you have a hospital system that's not under stress, you have a situation that if some spike happens, you're capable of dealing with it, you have to allow the economy to go back to normal because then the health damage and the economic damage is so much greater from people that are avoiding those institutions with other health issues and other health problems. So I think, you know, I think the resolution from, from uh, the chamber is very, is, uh, very measured, very appropriate. So I wanna ask Russ and Kim a question. 
um, as businesses start to reopen and employees start to come back to work, um, there's going to be the same kind of challenge and fear that exists with the consumer is existing with the employee. Is it safe to come back to my workplace? I, I keep seeing businesses where there are um, a spread of COVID going through. Um, so can you both talk from your own perspectives about where, how we, how employers focus on building that in confidence with their employees? Go ahead, Russ, if you'd like to start. Okay, yeah, for, for us, um, you know, we, I, I go around one just talking to all, all my employees, but, you know, we make everybody wear masks. Uh, we have certain social distancing that goes on here. Everybody has lunch six feet apart. Um, we have sanitizer. We've been making hand sanitizer here and, and also uh, repacking it from totes. Uh, to sell, uh, so we have that around. Uh, we I, I talk to employees all the time. What else can we do? Uh, right now, with the PPP program, we're able to send people home or have work from home uh, more than we can. So we try to distance as much as we we have here. And uh, I think just the fact that you know you 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 talk to them, you look at them, uh, you know you, they've seen the the physical improvements that we've tried to to do here with the automatic. Um, dispensing of, of items uh, that, you know, it, it is uh, reassuring uh, to them. Uh, and we, you know, just not trying to have them uh, work very closely together or or very long. It, it, it just builds their confidence. And, and so far, they, they've seemed receptive to it. But there is a lot of employees out there, I know, that are, you know, tentative about coming back or, or, or there is an unknown that we still have to get them over. So in, in our um, business at Engage, uh, 18 of our 20 type, the top clients have been essential. So we've sort of operated to some degree business as usual and trying to support them. So we've had this issue both within our own staff. We have four offices in the Milwaukee area. And so we have groups to make sure if there are four people that are running this area, they're actually in di different offices. So they can't take the possibility that all four of them would get infected at the same time. And then we'd have some, you know, there would be no one to be able to do it. In addition to which, we've been working with our clients very closely in terms of, you know, uh, using PPE equipment, uh, doing the uh, complete uh, cleaning if there's any indication of any either COVID or even a cold, and we don't know whether it's COVID yet, come and completely thoroughly clean the office. Um, we do temperature checks of all of our employees. We try to pre-screen before they hit the shop floor because a lot of the, the uh uh, associates that we deal with are non-English speakers, and they have varying degrees of, of English uh, capability. And so we're translating all of the, the documents uh, regarding safety for all of our clients into various languages. So we make sure that we can address as many of those associates as possible. So I think, you know, the more, and then just being open, if somebody's worried or they're nervous about it because they have small kids at home or they have a grandparent, you just have to deal with it, I think, individually to a very great extent. You have to deal with it one person at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also had a question about the the possibility of having healthcare screeners checking people's temperatures either for employees or customers, whether this would be a government mandate or up to individual companies. What are your thoughts on that? My guess is they're going to leave it to individual companies even if they make it a mandate. It'll be sort of figure out how to do it uh, from that perspective. And most companies that we're working with are already many steps ahead of that. At this point, they're doing a lot of their own um, checking of employees, and they're doing in various levels of detail. I don't know, Russ or Tim, Jim, what your experience has been. For myself, we, I, I did order a thermometer, but we uh, haven't gotten it yet, and I'll probably just use it for trying to differentiate when people have hay fever compared to when they're sick, or at least give confidence in the in, in here. So I'll probably ask, but I will not mandate it for uh, for taking temperatures of employees. Yeah, one one of our board members, uh, Jocko Jocko Falukama, who runs Palermo's, uh, just went through uh, a very challenging experience, uh, and I think we'll have a lot of lessons to share in terms of having a number of his workers uh, test positive. Uh, for COVID and then uh, being required uh, appropriate lo appropriately so to shut down uh, and then going through the process over the next 48 hours of finding enough tests, finding partners like uh, Advocate Aurora, 
um, and the National Guard actually to come in to set up a testing process so he could get his employees tested um, and open back up and then dealing with you know, the city, the county, the state, and the federal government uh, in terms of different guidelines in terms of what he needs to do to reopen. Um, so again, I think we'll be able to build some best practices pretty quickly uh, as companies go through these very challenging um, events uh, of having an employee test positive uh, and then going through the hoops that they need to go through to get back up and running. Well, and I, I think the the other thing, I'm on the board of several automotive suppliers, so Michigan is sort of the center of the universe in terms of COVID issues. And if you believe that we're going to be living with COVID for a while, as opposed to we're going to do everything we can to avoid COVID, then the reaction of what you do when you have a COVID incident is different. And so increasingly, companies are developing policies that if they have a COVID incident, they shut it down for 24 hours, they bring in an industrial cleaning service, they clean everything, they test everybody 100%, and then the next 24 hours later, they're up and running again. And I think that's going to be that's going to be hard for people to get their head around, that it's not, I either keep COVID completely out of here or I'm shut down for two weeks. That's not realistic from a business perspective. And so I think all of that's going to evolve along with the retail side. It goes back to that, you know, how comfortable are you with feeling safe when you go to work, when you go to a store, whatever. Yeah, good que a question here for Tim uh, on MMEC's position we take today versus what the healthcare community is saying. And maybe this is a good chance to let everybody know that uh, all of Wisconsin's healthcare institutions are represented on MMAC's board. Yeah, sure. So there, there we followed early on, you know, uh, as a part of getting the best data, um, we have uh, the CEO for um, Advocate Aurora, uh, Freightert, Children's, and Ascension, are four of the 70 board members that make up the association board elected by the membership. Uh, and their guidance uh, early on, uh, to Kim's point about flattening the curve versus eliminating it, uh, was, imp was important input to make sure that both their institutions and their employees were not put in harm's way uh, and were not facing the brunt of the crisis. Um, and that feedback now today uh, a, a couple weeks into Safer at Home, along with what individual companies have done, was very much key to informing the board about the decision it took, which was unanimously supported uh, by uh, all of our board members, obviously, uh, and the healthcare leaders that were part of it. Uh, and so I think it's an important to recognize where we are, uh, that we have flattened the curve here in Wisconsin, by and large, the COVID crisis, the COVID uh, impact is not going to way away. It's going to be diminished, um, and we have reached the point again. They're starting to bring in, um, uh, in uh, the customers uh, for essential uh, surgeries and other procedures. Um, they're starting to open back up, uh, and that was a really key indicator for us to say um, we are ready to take the next step uh, and start to bring more businesses back online. Uh, and again, I, listening to both Russ and Kim, I uh, have a lot of confidence that uh, employers are going to be stepping up quickly to put in the procedures that they need to, to deal both with their employees and their customers uh, and start to move us into, uh, as Jonas says, back to the future, this new normal, where we're going to be dealing with this as we go forward. We also had a specific question about why Dr. Raymond is not with us today, and I'd like to remind everybody that he is still joining us every day at 3.30. I will send the registration link in the chat pane right now. We just wanted to economize his time for the uh, Tuesday morning sessions. Good. Another good question about how do we keep the discussion civil and keep people, not politics, at the forefront of these discussions? Good luck. I don't... Uh... I, th I think it does. I think it does have a bit to do with your. Um, and I don't think it's so much political. I think there's a tendency to put it politically. How how much people go? Yeah, there's risk in the world. I'm not that worried about it. And other people that are much more conservative from a health perspective. Um, I think if you know, I think the the MMAC is doing a really good job of trying to just focus on the facts, as opposed to opinion. If we can actually look at the trend data, we can look at the kind of data that Jim presented 
then you can deal with the facts and make intelligent decisions. It's when it gets emotional that it becomes a very difficult thing to, to talk through and it gets thrown into the whole political um, universe. That's when it gets really out of control. No, Russ, I, I, we I had, uh, no, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Chris. Russ, we had a question, a uh, very nuts and bolts question about what percentage of your regular production capacity are you at right now? Uh, we're producing right about now about, uh, we're, we're down about 31% from last year in, 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 uh, in sales of beer, mostly because kegs are 30%. Uh, we're up in, in uh, the big box stores uh, very nicely, but then a lot of people bought our, our product either at, uh, in the bars and restaurants and bottles and cans, and that's down. And also we don't have uh, venues like uh, Pfizer Forum and um, and uh, Miller Park that we're selling at, so that's about where we're we're currently at. So we're uh, so we're down on on those respects, and obviously we're down with the the restaurant too. Had several questions about requiring employees or customers to wear face coverings. Where do you come down on that for each of you? Um, everybody uh, here is wearing one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think from a to, to go to Russ's point, particularly in the retail environment and to some extent in manufacturing, the staff and the people there, in order to reinforce that you take it seriously and we're trying to be as safe as we possibly can be, will be wearing masks, whether those are grocery stores or retail or whatever. And then I think if you if you dictate that to your customers coming in, that could be difficult because people have very different viewpoints. So I think we're just going to have to feel our way there a bit. Um, in most cases, there's some level of PPE that's required at every client that we have. And again, Chris, I would point people to our PPE exchange, which is at least one additional resource uh, for companies that are both producing and companies that are looking for it. And again, uh, to the point of the previous question, as we move through the crisis, as it impacts our healthcare institutions, um, and they have improved uh, their sourcing for PPE, uh, we're now starting move, to move into this phase as companies come back online and they're going to need PPE for their employees. Um, you've seen all the major airlines now are going to require it uh, when you fly. Um, look at a company here locally like Quad Graphics, which has actually uh, transferred one of its lines to making um, cloth PPE coverings, first for their employees, uh, second for their suppliers, and third, they have reached out to other local manufacturers uh, if they can uh, uh, provide that uh, uh, for the employees here uh, in the region. So I think as Kim identified, there's a need here and you're gonna start to see an uptick in people providing that. Uh, so that should be less a barrier for people coming back to work. Yeah, and we just provided a link to the PPE marketplace on our website in the chat function. So anybody who's interested can check it out there. I had a question about Warren Buffett who made some comments about the idea that Businesses may need less physical space in the future and more people may work at home. Uh, Russ and Kim and Tim and Jim, where do you come down on that idea? Um, for ourselves, we, we do have some of our salespeople working at home right now and down there and, and, and it, it seems to be working. I, I'm, I'm sure that will happen. Uh, there's no doubt my, my daughter lives in San Francisco and she's telling me how many people there are, are, are just asking to work at home instead of uh, uh, at the job right now. So I think you are going to be seeing um, a lot of in-home or um, out of the workplace uh, uh, work being done right now and in the future. I think that's one thing that this will definitely change. I believe it's very dependent on what type of business you're in. If you're doing computer support services, it's really easy to say, hey, I'll just work out of my house. I don't have to come in. I think in heavily populated areas, I think it is a coastal to some degree versus the, the rest of the country. If you're in an intensely populated area like San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, there will be a tendency to have more of that. But many of the jobs you can't do from home, right? particularly if you're in manufacturing distribution, you still have physical goods that you're dealing with. Uh, so I think it's going to be very segment specific. <laughs> Yeah, I would um, agree with that. Uh, interesting, Russ, your uh, daughter in San Francisco, I saw on the Wall Street this morning that traffic in San Francisco is down 92 percent. Um, and so people may be getting used to not sitting in their car. Uh, 
back to back uh, on, a, on a freeway. Here, I think it's uh, in, in Milwaukee and elsewhere, as Kim noted, it's going to be one of the biggest challenges people have uh, going forward. And I kind of think of it in the sequencing of, you know, the next three months, the next six months, um, and the next two years. Um, and certainly in the short period of time, every employer is going to have to deal with the challenge of people that uh, have kids in school who, who are not going to be in school, uh, the potential of um, daycare and camps and things over the summer, and then the uncertainty of what the fall looks like uh, for kids returning to school, and hopefully that turns around. So uh, we're all going to have to deal with both the situation that individual employees have uh, with other things going on in their life, as well as the opportunity uh, to um, work smarter um, and in some cases have a different physical configuration um, in offices, which I can see going a bit of both ways, which is less space because people will work at home, but people coming into the office may want more space. Uh, yesterday, um, and I'll refer, a, uh, we can refer a link to you, we had an interesting presentation uh, from Peggy Coakley, um, and she saw, she, she showed a lot of the products coming into the marketplace uh, that are low cost and effective ways to separate uh, people within their current workspaces. Um, and, and I think that is also something that's going to be helpful. We also had a, a similar related question about the idea of splitting your workforce into teams and either varying days or varying weeks that certain groups are in the office. Is, is that going to become an effective strategy for social distancing in the office? We've been doing that since the crisis started, where we have people coming in two days this week, three days next week, going into this office versus that office. So yes, I think there's going to be a lot more of that sort of roving teams to um, deal with this type of situation. When all this first got started like six weeks ago, we took a pretty hard look at a number of global companies that had operations here and how they dealt with things in Europe and in China and other places. And that was a hallmark of almost all their plans was a staggering of workflow, a staggering of people coming in and out of the facility. And I, and I think that's going to be an important part of what we do here too. Yeah, we have a smaller workforce here, so it's kind of hard for us to do staggering um, uh, work shifts here. We just bring in people uh, for what we need them or what they need to be done here and before they go home. Great. Thank you to you all and thank you to everybody who asked the question today. Good. Again, Russ, uh, my thanks to you. Uh, Kim, thank you. Uh, Jim, appreciate uh, the input on the economic situation. Um, and uh, look forward to those of you can joining us next week at 11. Uh, and we also have our daily podcast uh, or webcast this afternoon uh, at 3.30. Uh, and Dr. Raymond will be on. So have a safe, uh, healthy rest of your week. Um, and again, I appreciate the input uh, from Russ and, and Kim today, taking time out of uh, the crush of your daily business to join us uh, and share some insights. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.